I have to say I'm, I'm deeply honored um, to be here for this memorial, uh, the celebration of Larry's academic career and, uh, and also the, for the way he's touched us with his wisdom over the years. And, and in my case, um, the unwavering support he's given to me at various critical moments uh, in my career. Um, in 1969, I was uh, finishing my PhD uh, at uh, University of Western Ontario here in Middlesex College. Uh, this is where the psychology department um, was located at the time. And I wanted to continue um, with a postdoc. And I just read um, a paper by Nick Humphrey and Larry Weiskrantz published in 1997 in Nature called Vision uh, in the monkey after removal of stride cortex. And uh, I was absolutely blown away by this paper. I found it very exciting. And so I took out one of those uh, flimsy uh, air letters uh, and uh, wrote a letter to Larry and asked if I could come to the uh, postdoc uh, in his lab. I also wrote to the uh, National Research Council of Canada uh, to ask for support uh, postdoc support, uh, so I could do that. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, both things uh, happened. Uh, I did get support, and Larry kindly wrote back on another flimsy blue air letter uh, some weeks later and uh, told me that I was more than welcome uh, to join him uh, in Oxford, uh, and I did. And I met this young man, uh, Larry Weiskrantz, uh, and Nick Humphrey and Alan Cowie uh, and a lot of uh, really wonderful people from whom I learned a great deal. Uh, the uh, building, the new building, uh, was just uh, uh, beginning to be constructed then in 1969, in the fall of 69, and we were distributed across Oxford. My, uh, my labs were uh, on Keeble Road, uh, and I shared those uh, uh, facilities with, with Paul Dean, uh, with Andrew Mays, with uh, Robert Druitt, John Nicholson, Sheila Zinkin was there. And during that time, um, with them and indeed with Larry and uh, Alan Cowie, uh, I was engaged in uh, so many wonderful discussions uh, about awareness, about consciousness, uh, about uh, vision uh, without strike cortex. Um, and I have to say, uh, it was a wonderful learning experience for me that really set me up uh, for a lot of what I'm going to talk about uh, uh, in, in the next few minutes. I have to say, when I finished my two years uh, at, uh, at Oxford, uh, I had uh, very little to show for it in terms of um, a CV, a very thin CV. Uh, in, uh, uh, indeed, it was uh, so embarrassing uh, that when I, I wrote letters back to Canada uh, to look for positions and so on, uh, sometimes I didn't even get an answer. Um, and jobs were pretty thin on the ground in the UK as well. Um, and I think a, a lot of that was due to the fact that I spent a lot of time um, having discussions with people uh, about politics uh, and indeed about science uh, in the Lamb and Flag just down the street. But one day, Larry uh, came out uh, to the back garden in that old place uh, where the greenhouses were, uh, and he asked me if I would like a job uh, at St. Andrews uh, in Scotland. I knew nothing about St. Andrews, but I did know I wanted a job. And so I said, well, yes, I would, I would love that. And so I made the journey to St. Andrews, and much uh, to my um, uh, surprise, uh, I was offered the job. Uh, clearly, Larry uh, was a kingmaker. Uh, and I uh, got a job at St. Andrews, and I was there for a wonderful six years, uh, where I met uh, Brian Rogers, uh, and many other people, including uh, this young man, uh, David Milner, with whom I formed a lifetime uh, friendship and collaboration. We still work together. And uh, David and I wrote a grant together, actually, in 1973 to the uh, uh, UK SRC. And uh, it was on the role of the superior colliculus in orienting behavior uh, in this animal, the rat. Uh, and we were, um, we were given the grant, but provisionally. We, uh, we were told that in order to have the grant, uh, we had to uh, go down to Oxford and uh, confer with Larry Weiskrantz uh, about whether or not we were on the right track. 
Uh, so we dutifully uh, went down to Oxford and uh, we met with Larry. Uh, Larry gave us uh, some very sage advice um, and uh, we had a nice lunch. Uh, and he signed off, uh, and we got the SRC grant. So I, I'm very grateful uh, for Larry, to Larry uh, uh, for allowing us to move forward with that SRC grant, which resulted, I must say, in a number of, uh, I think, still uh, important papers that David and I wrote. Um, in 77, uh, I left St. Andrews and returned to Canada. I was homesick. I wanted to go home. And one of the people who wrote a letter for me uh, was Larry Weiskrantz, and I ended up back at my alma mater, uh, the University of Western Ontario, uh, where I still am, and I'm again grateful uh, to Larry uh, for, for writing me a, a, what I assume was a, a strong letter. Now, since then, uh, since returning to Canada, uh, David and I, as I've intimated, have continued to collaborate uh, and we uh, really, I, I think both of us heavily influenced by Larry's ideas, uh, proposed um, back in uh, 1992 that there's been evolutionary pressure for the development of, of two kinds of visual systems uh, in the cerebral cortex uh, of primates and indeed in other vertebrates as well. The, the first of these um, is one that uh, allows uh, you out there uh, to recognize the objects in that picture, to recognize uh, the cup and the pencil, the wristwatch, the hand, and so on, and to recognize, of course, that it's a picture. And that visual system is, we argued, very different from the one that allows the actor in the picture uh, to reach out and uh, pick up the cup. That fundamentally different transformations are involved and different neural structures are engaged. We also suggested that you could map those two distinctive uh, visual uh, functions onto the two prominent pathways that had been identified uh, in the primate brain in the, and indeed now in the human brain. Uh, pathways, uh, both of which arise in early uh, visual cortex, in the striate cortex and in other uh, early visual areas. One projecting dorsally uh, along the top of the brain uh, to the posterior parietal cortex, to areas of the brain that are intimately connected with the motor system, uh, that send projections, for example, down to the brain stem, um, uh, send or have reciprocal connections with premotor cortex. Uh, one, in other words, a system that's exquisitely poised for transforming visual information into the required motor coordinates for action. And there's another system that also arises in these early visual areas, but projects instead ventrally the, down the bottom of the brain, bottom of the cerebral cortex, uh, is not directly connected with the motor system and uh, has uh, connections instead uh, with uh, medial temporal areas that are involved uh, in um, social behavior, uh, in, in memory, uh, projections to the prefrontal cortex that are important for decision making. In other words, a system uh, that is uh, well connected uh, for constructing our visual percepts of the world so that we can think about it, make decisions, choose between different courses of action, and so on. Now, we set out these ideas in detail, David and I, uh, in the Oxford Psychology Series, then edited by Larry, um, in a book called The Visual Brain in Action that was published in 1995. And we were absolutely thrilled when Larry agreed to write the foreword uh, for that book. Uh, and, um, and this book has gone into the second edition now, and uh, that foreword uh, is still there. And we were uh, uh, really over the moon that he agreed to do this. In that book, we began uh, by... Um, when we got into the uh, particular experiments that, that we carried out, um, we described work on a patient DF, a young woman at the time uh, who developed uh, hypoxia from carbon monoxide poisoning. There was a faulty heater uh, in the bathroom in which she was uh, having a shower, and her brain uh, was uh, soon deprived of oxygen. Coma, and uh, she recovered uh, some 24 hours later from that uh, coma. Uh, the uh, scans that were done in her brain at the time revealed diffuse cortical brain damage uh, throughout uh, uh, her brain, uh, but these very concentrated bilateral lesions 
uh, in that ventral stream, that perceptual stream, uh, but, but sparing early visual areas. The most salient symptom she had was visual form agnosia. That is, she could not recognize objects on the basis of their form. Um, but clearly, uh, clinical and psychophysical testing uh, revealed that she was largely in the normal range. So she had this rather particular deficit of being unable to recognize objects on the basis of their form. Um, here she is. Um, and this is her catching a ball. And she does very well, as you'll see. And you'll have to remember that this is uh, a, a woman who cannot recognize um, common objects. She uh, cannot tell the difference uh, in a line drawing between a square uh, and a triangle. Um, she um, is, uh, got spared color and texture vision. It's just the form that she's insensitive to. So that when she's presented with uh, a rather cheap uh, flashlight like this or a torch like this, uh, and she's uh, asked to describe it. This is what she says. She says, oh, it's made out of metal. Is it aluminum? It's got red plastic on it. And then she makes a kind of educated guess on the basis of that. She says, oh, well, is it some sort of kitchen utensil? Which is not bad, given that uh, those surface uh, clues. Uh, but uh, of course, it's uh, a torch. And she recognizes it right away when it's placed in her hand. She says, oh, yes, it's a." Uh, um, it's, a, it's a torch, which I, I guess is your perverse word for uh, flashlight, but she, she too um, is uh, um, from the UK. Her deficit is so profound that she can't, as David discovered when he was testing her informally, is so profound that she can't even tell you the orientation of a pencil held up in front of her. She might recognize that it's a pencil. She could say, oh, it's yellow. Is it a pencil? because, of course, pencils often have that uh, characteristic uh, pencil -y color. Uh, and given that she can identify it, you might, uh, uh, on the basis of the surface cues, uh, you might think that it wouldn't be uh, very difficult to say whether or not it was uh, being held upright or uh, vertically or on a slant. But in fact, she can't do that. She can't tell you. But one day, uh, when David was testing her uh, in this fashion, uh, he, she said suddenly, oh, let me see that. And she reached out to grab the pencil. Uh, this is a mock-up. We didn't have uh, the video running at the time. Uh, but what you can see is that she oriented her hand correctly in flight for the orientation of the pencil. That is, her hand knew the orientation of the pencil, uh, even though she didn't. So you know, editors of journals um, are, are not convinced by these anecdotes. Uh, so we tested her uh, more formally on this uh, slot task in which the slot could be put in any one of a number of different orientations. And she was asked to do um, two things. She was first of all asked to take a handheld card and tell us what the orientation of that slot was by matching it with the orientation uh, of the handheld card. And here she is uh, doing that. Uh, I have to say, I, I, I resurrected these from VHS tapes uh, that were taken in 1990. I only did it about a year ago. Uh, and uh, they came out uh, remarkably well, I have to say. I hope you can see it. Um, but uh, really what she's really telling you is what uh, she sees out there. And, and these are her attempts to orient her hand correctly for the orientation of the slot. Uh, and she is, uh, doesn't do very well, uh, as you see. She'll reach out now, uh, not reach out, but she'll turn the card to match the slot. And here she's got it absolutely wrong. Uh, it's 90 degrees off. And she goes on like this. Um, then you change the task. And you say, look, I, I, I know you can't see the orientation of the slot, but I want you to humor me uh, and to reach out and post the card in your hand into the slot. And here you see her doing this. She does very well. So when you change the task from one where she's reporting on what she sees onto, onto one where she's just engaging the visual motor system uh, in order to get the card into the slot, she does much better on the visual motor task than she does on the matching task. She's a little awkward, but she gets the orientation correct. So if you um, put all those data together uh, and you 
normalize the correct orientation uh, to vertical, what you can see is that she does very poorly on matching, but very well uh, when she's posting the card. So she has what Larry, uh, I think, called. She is able to use this information that's unconscious that she cannot report on about the orientation of the slot to control her movements, despite the fact that she has no conscious perception uh, of the orientation uh, of the slot. Now, we also tested her with objects of different sizes, objects of different shape, and again, uh, she showed the same um, inability to report on the shape and size, even though uh, she was able to reach out and grab the objects deftly, uh, as well as a, a, a normal uh, individual might. But what about patients who have damage in the stream that, as I said, transforms visual information uh, into the required coordinates uh, for movement. If they have damage there uh, and they're uh, given uh, a slot, this in a, in a much more informal clinical fashion by Marie Trey's Paranin, uh, in fact, uh, some years before we tested DF on a similar task, what you can see uh, is that when the, she's uh, asked to post her hand through the card, she does very poorly in flight, but as soon as her hand touches the slot, she's able to slip it in um, easily using uh, tactile cues. On the other hand, verbally, she has no problem. You can say uh, it's slanted, it's horizontal, it's vertical, whatever the slot's orientation might be. So what we have here uh, is what uh, is sometimes referred to as a double dissociation. That is, we have someone who has damage in the ventral stream, who shows spared visual motor control, uh, but very poor perception. And on the other hand, we have someone with damage in the dorsal stream who has uh, pretty well preserved per uh, perception, uh, but is uh, very poor at visual motor control. But you know, Larry uh, reminds us that double dissociation Double dissociations are powerful, uh, and they're very useful pragmatically, but they're not omnipotent. That is, it, it, it isn't the uh, sort of be-all and end-all, uh, as some neuropsychologists would have you believe. But uh, fortunately, um, a, a large number of other studies uh, from uh, fMRI, uh, uh, other forms of imaging, have um, confirmed uh, very much this dissociation uh, between uh, in patients uh, and also uh, in normal observers uh, between a, a dorsal stream uh, and a, a ventral stream. Work in the monkey, uh, recording from the ventral stream and recording from the dorsal stream also lines up very well uh, with this story. Uh, and some much more controversial uh, visual motor psychophysics uh, also um, uh, fits well with this story. So I think uh, uh, this, this uh, conception of a vision for action system that's separate from a vision for uh, perception, a vision for perception system, um, is uh, lines up very well uh, with the ideas of blind sight uh, that Larry uh, put forward uh, back in the 1970s. But of course, we can ask the question, um, and indeed, it's a question that Larry asked as well. Why do we need two visual systems in the cerebral cortex? Why couldn't we have one general purpose um, system that provides all of the required uh, platforms for both thinking about the world and making decisions as well as acting uh, on the world? And that's uh, an important question to ask. And I think the answer to that question lies here, or at least it lies uh, here for me. Uh, and that is uh, that you recognize this um, as a glass of beer. At least I hope you do. Uh, it's a glass of Canadian beer. And if you were in the picture, if you were in the photo, and you backed away uh, from the glass of beer, it would still look like a glass of beer. And if you crouched down and peered at it uh, from the tabletop, it would also look like a glass of beer. And if you uh, moved back and, uh, uh, and, and leaned over, uh, then it would also look like one. And if you had too many glasses of beer, it might be the last thing uh, that you saw. Um, this, of course, is what um, 
uh, you know, people in the 19th century uh, knew uh, and, and, and wrote about, uh, it's object constancy. It's the notion that uh, we see objects as what they are, independent of the geometry uh, on our eye, on our retina. And of course, that's uh, very useful uh, for uh, understanding the world. And uh, indeed, it's, uh, one might argue, a pre-adaptation for watching television. Because otherwise, uh, you wouldn't be able to understand what was going on on the screen. Uh, because of course, you're not working in the real metrics of the world. On the other hand, if you want to pick up the glass of beer, um, you have to know the real world metrics. You have to know the position of the glass with respect to your hand, the orientation of the handle with respect to your hand, in order to get your hand on it. Also, your visual motor system has to work in real time. You have to do that computation as a just-in-time computation before you actually uh, engage uh, with uh, the object uh, of your desire. So you can ask the question, what would DF do if she was asked um, to pantomime a movement after being shown the target object a few seconds earlier? So she's not working in real time. She's working on some kind of memory of what it was that she saw two seconds before. And if you do that experiment, what you find uh, is that in real time, of course, uh, these are raw data, uh, she opens her hand wider for the uh, 50 millimeter object than she does for the 25 millimeter object. But if you show her that object, and then you take it away, and then you say, no, show me how um, you would have picked it up, she can't do it. Uh, because, of course, if you think about it, she never really saw the object in the first place. When in real time, her visual motor system was engaged, but when she had to depend on a memory of uh, only two seconds uh, uh, before, uh, she was incapable uh, of um, generating an accurate grasp pantomime. So one way to think about this, I've tried to uh, put it in uh, terms I think would resonate with what Larry um, uh, would, would say about blind sight, is that to the left of that dotted line, we have things that are completely inaccessible to consciousness. That is all of the computations that underlie our visual motor behavior, that underlie our perception. But the ventral stream eventually does generate some kind of percept of the world, some kind of percept, and that percept could be conscious. We could, we could see what we're looking at, or it might not be conscious. We might not be attending to it, but it's still being processed in some fashion. On the other hand, when we uh, reach out uh, and pick up an object, uh, then we might be conscious of the uh, behavior that we're engaged in, uh, or we might not. We might be talking to somebody else while we reached out and picked up our cup of coffee and not really aware of the action that we're performing. But the point I want to make is that what we're not conscious of is the visual information that's being used to actually control that movement. That's completely inaccessible to consciousness. So it's that we have two products. We have a product which is an action, uh, which is um, either conscious or unconscious, and we have a product which is a percept of which we're either conscious or unconscious. So I think that uh, Larry, uh, and, and indeed he wrote this uh, in uh, Consciousness Lost and Found, would characterize the everyday operation of the dorsal stream as, uh, in a sense, uh, blind sight without blindness. So in all of us, there's a kind of blind sight, uh, which is all of the sort of everyday skill movements that we produce under visual motor control. And it's just uh, a kind of illusion that it's the conscious visual experience that we have that's controlling those movements. So that when we play a game of tennis, we're well aware of the fact that we're doing so, and we're well aware that that was a pretty vicious serve that uh, someone delivered up on the other side of the net, but when we return it with the sweet spot uh, of the racket, what we're not aware of is the vis visual information that was used in order for us to connect uh, with that ball uh, so, so beautifully. So I, th I think you'll agree that uh, in this description I've given of the dorsal and ventral streams that uh, David and I put together, you can see uh, in, in, in very clear fashion, the echoes of Larry's original conceptions about how blind sight might operate. And I, I have to say that uh, the last time I saw Larry, um, he was in good spirits. And of course, uh, that was uh, at the meeting uh, in Torino 
that, uh, uh, that Marco uh, organized, uh, and there are so many of us there uh, celebrating his 90th birthday. And uh, I um, am, I'll just, just end uh, by saying uh, how grateful I am to Larry um, for all of the uh, moments in which he stepped into my life uh, uh, when, from the time I was a postdoc uh, until um, 1990, oh, sorry, his 90th birthday in 2016 uh, in, uh, in Italy. That was a wonderful occasion. And I'll stop there. Thank you.